is not <laughs> Russia is not a, at war with Ukraine. Russia is at war with uh, the West, the West that wants to put itself in the place of God and command everybody what to be, how to be, how to live our lives. We do not do carpet bombings of the kind that the Americans did in Iraq or in Afghanistan. So one of the reasons this war is so difficult is because it has some of the Russians uh, fighting against the Russians because not all of them are like they are Ukrainian by their civic affiliation. Russia cannot agree with being, you know, with living side by side with a country that explicitly wants to be used to attack Moscow or, you know, Russia's development, Russia's... It makes no sense to stop fighting because it's a very cheap war for them. Humanity to dark ages is, is actually, it doesn't take that much time. And I don't know, to be honest, in, in response, Hello and welcome to Infer Talks, a podcast where we put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Our guest today is a prominent voice presenting a counter perspective on global politics in the English language news arena. Host of RT's Worlds Apart, we have in our studio today, Oksana Boyko. Oksana, welcome to the podcast. It, it, the pleasure is all mine, Hajra. Uh, good day to you and all your audience. Thank you so much. So how have you been doing? How is everything with you? Well, I've been doing uh, fine. You asked me that question before uh, and I said it was uh, going okay, even though for some reason it's not, <laughs> I guess it's not appropriate these days to acknowledge that your life is okay. But I think uh, it applies even more generally. Russia is in a state of war with our neighboring country, a country where I have relatives and my heart goes out to them and many of the Ukrainians who suffer for no good reason. But having said that, uh, life go goes on and uh, I try to do my best both at work and at home. And on balance, I, I cannot complain. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's also important to have a balance in life, you know, for you to be able to give uh, the most to work, you have to be fulfilled in your personal life as well. So honestly, yeah, personal and spiritual life as well, because I think the this war that we are currently in, not just with uh, Ukraine, and I think the, the Russia's narrative, and we can talk more about that later, is not <laughs> Russia is not a, at war with Ukraine, Russia is at war with uh, the West, the West that wants to put itself in the place of God and command everybody what to be, how to be, how to live our lives, how to determine our values, how to build our relationship with neighbors or you know countries far away as, for example, Pakistan. Uh, we accepted that for some time, but uh, no longer willing. And uh, to us, uh, it's an existential battle for a battle for the right to be ourselves. And we we think that perhaps by you know, fighting our own battle, we are also helping other nations to recognize that the grass, the grass is not always greener on the other side, that there are many valuable things in your own country, in your own culture, in your own society, something that you have to appreciate and try to cultivate rather than, uh, you know, asking for permission for, from somebody across the world who doesn't even bother to learn anything about your own society. It's a it's a very tall order uh, to 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 present a challenge to such a uh, you know such a cemented sort of a uh, perspective and an overarching influence um, but we'll come to that in a little bit i want to start with how you basically reconcile um, the ethics of journalism uh, in a time of crisis and as you may well and understand better than me perhaps uh, how important it is to uphold the truth when it comes to um, situations like the one that we're seeing uh, unfolding between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and a number of perspectives are going to come about, a number of uh, positions uh, are going to come about. How do you see your role as someone uh, who is entrusted with bringing the truth to the world? How do you sort of deal with the kind of crisis uh, that is happening? And how do you see your role uh, and your responsibility as a journalist in this context? Well, that's also a very tall order. Uh, uh, it's a gigantic question that you're asking. But from a personal perspective, I would uh, respond to it this way. I'm also a big fan of psychology. I'm studying it professionally, especially the depth psychology of Carl Jung. And, uh, it's a, it's a field that studies collective unconscious and the influences of the collective unconscious on individual psyches. And 
uh, but it's not only in the, in that particular realm of psychology, but in many others, they teach you to have a meta position. So essentially, it's very uh, similar to what uh, people in the East call mindfulness. When you observe what's going on, when you understand your own emotions, when you try not to identify with any one of them, although recognizing that, you know, this is what it is. And you try to be as honest as you can be with yourself first and foremost with yourself, recognizing that the truth is always personal. I mean, uh, each one of us has a certain and very peculiar vantage point onto the world, onto reality. And I think the best we can do is to, you know, show it the way we perceive it without actually hiding that it's our position. Yeah. Because I think uh, when I was studying in the States, I, I, I was a journalism student there like some 20 years ago. And at that time, they didn't uh, teach us about objectivity. They taught us about balance. Uh, you know, there was a time in American journalistic schools when they actually taught you about balance. Right. Understanding that, uh, you know, a different guy or a different side may have a different position. And uh, what you're trying to do as a journalist to be, is to be honest about uh, where different sides are coming from. And uh, that's what I try to practice, but it is uh, more difficult uh, for this war than other wars. And I covered, I spent a lot of years covering wars in like Libya, Syria, and because yeah. it was far away, like I sympathized with the people, I liked their culture, but they weren't part of my sort of own fabric, cultural yeah. fabric. But with Ukraine, it's much more difficult because most of us have relatives there. So it's you know, no matter what you do, even if when the Russian army is winning, uh, we are losing nonetheless because there are many innocent civilians who are suffering. But uh, you, you try to keep all those issues uh, in your reporting, in your analysis, and also in your soul. I think it's, it's important to be actually conscious of what you feel and be honest uh, with yourself about it. I, I, I don't think I can disagree with you on that. Um, particularly on the matter of uh, truth being subjective to each person um, and being honest with ourselves about where we come from and our truth being our own truth. Um, so that brings me to my uh, next point where um, you were in Pakistan uh, sometime last year and you also participated in the uh, Islamabad security dialogue and you raised uh, some of these points over there as well. Um, particularly with regards to uh, bias, when it comes to uh, you know the mainstream media um, as 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 we know it, um, and I've also come across uh, a very a very small clip of you with the with the um, Liu Shang, I believe, from uh, CGTN, who also echoed your um, sort of um, apprehensions on this that. Um, there is something of a bias when it comes to uh, the English language journalism community that sort of leans towards the West. Do you think that is true? Do you think that there's something plaguing popular Western reporting uh, and particularly on the Russia-Ukraine crisis? Well, I think bias is too delicate of a word here. I think there is a very transparent censorship and a very merciless censorship going on. I mean, I can talk to you and as I said at, the, at that uh, conference in Islamabad, the Islamabad Security Dialogue, there are very few capitals in the world where we can actually voice our position, you know, uh, when we actually can speak without uh, being hushed, because uh, it, it, I do my interviews with uh, great speakers, but, you know, in terms of uh, bringing them to the Western audience, you cannot imagine uh, what kind of hurdles we have to overcome because I mean most of our social media accounts uh, initial social media accounts were simply blocked but for no reason whatsoever other than us being uh, from Russia but uh, I think bias is uh, something that is perhaps uh, not fully conscious I think what's going on is a very deliberate policy very conscious and very deliberate policy by social media platforms and certain western governments to uh, essentially limit that population's access to uh, not just the uh, alternative point of views, but uh, to critical, critical thinking, because you cannot develop critical thinking without encountering things that you may disagree with. And that, I think, shows you and all of us the amount of trust those governments have in their own population if they have to 
sort of block everything preemptively b- before even allowing the people to make up their own mind. That is true, but don't, but that's kind of a practice for uh, states in general, isn't it? When it comes to, uh, you know, like uh, sort of positioning yourself in a situation where you've, um, you know, like fostered this competition, um, national security imperative. I don't, I don't think that's uh, the practice, at least maybe like it was a practice for Moscow when the, at the times of the Soviet Union, it, it was, uh, you know, we we Russians in, in our own historic example saw how detrimental it is. I mean, you can never ever um, persuade anybody by simply blocking access. That that thing doesn't work, right. and it, it it's never was supposed to work. So I think it's it's a foolish practice. You better let uh, everything flow. I mean, the freedom of speech, <laughs> as it was uh, once uh, articulated, is actually a great concept. I'm I'm actually really glad you brought this up because I was also, um, you know, like there, naturally a lot of my own reading is also from Western media. So my apologies for uh, framing these questions like that. Absolutely, bring it on. I, I heard some of them, I'm sure. <laughs> right. So, and I'm pretty sure you've heard this one as well. But there's also this um, overarching critique against um, Russian state cens- censorship. Um, we had a, a guest on our podcast recently um, who also said that he was uh, barred from uh, uh, securing a visa to Russia. Um, and then, uh, you know, BBC has uh, run into trouble while reporting from Russia, Voice of America, then the recent block on uh, Medusa, um, and then, you know, a couple of years earlier uh, on, on inst- you know, like platforms like Bellingcat, for example. Um, so naturally, the most of what I've read on this is, is, is coming from uh, Western media and Western platforms, but I'd like to pick your brain on that. What, what is it that is barring um, these organizations and these outlets from freely performing their duties um, in Russia? And what is the Russian state's uh, sort of, what are their apprehensions uh, about uh, these certain journalists who've been barred from uh, reporting from Russia? Well, Hadra, I think you you mentioned several outlets and uh, they all represent different cases. For example, BBC and a couple of other international networks, they weren't barred. Uh, It was essentially a diplomatic, action taken in response for their country's uh, blocking RT, my own station for no apparent reason. And you can argue that Russia should have turned the other cheek and uh, allow those state-sponsored media, because BBC is state-sponsored, you know, like it's uh, being paid by British taxpayers to operate. But uh, that would have been, uh, I think, unfair. And in diplomacy, at least uh, when it comes to Russia, Russia subscribes to the principle of reciprocity. So if a state-owned or state-supported, state-funded organization is closed in one country, then the media outlets directly supported by that state in uh, in, the, in another country will be will receive the same treatment. Right. You mentioned Medusa. Medusa is somewhat different because in Russia there is a law that you can uh, report and do your journalistic uh, job, but you have to be transparent about your sources of funding. And Medusa uh, was receiving foreign funding and didn't want to be very transparent about it. And uh, they, uh, I think, moved out of Russia with the beginning of this military operation. And uh, I'm not sure, but I think there's some operations that are continuing. I had a couple of friends who work there. So like behind, uh, you know, in our private life, we can still uh, talk. But uh, it's uh, it was more about uh, using uh, media as um, essentially as, as a bullhorn for Western narrative. And it's it's allowed in Russia to do that, but you have to be clear about you doing that right. rather than presenting yourself as uh, as an independent and free media organization. And uh, if you check uh, the uh, the amount of money the United States openly uh, spends on supporting the so-called free media in uh, other countries, uh, you would find a very <laughs> very uh, sort of consistent approach to it. In countries that are allies to the United States, the reporting on government tends to be positive, but in the countries that tend to be not necessarily oppositional to the United States, but uh, voice their disagreement with some of the American policies, those uh, media are always used not only to criticize those governments, those that would be fine, but to 
uh, foment uh, various activities among the population, open calling for the violation of the law and things like that, and sort of trying to prey on uh, on the youth, which uh, due to their rebellious nature is always the, the easiest uh, sort of population group to make the society unstable. So Russia, Russia's uh, media have their own issues with freedom of speech. It has very little to do with uh, the control of the state because the state as, as it is right now has so many issues. They don't have enough people and resources to control the narrative. It's impossible in this day and age to do that. But I, I think the, the problem is uh, simply the fact that with the West, they have long uh, used this mantra that perception is reality, and they are trying to change the rela reality on the ground in, in this country or in many others through changing the perception of people. And uh, that makes certain governments somewhat uh, suspicious and attentive to foreign funded uh, newspapers or websites. That makes sense, but in, 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 in perspective of uh, a state trying to secure its own um, sort of, uh, you know, like transparency on, on, on who is reporting what from where and for what purpose. Um, so thank you for clarifying that because I, I, I couldn't find a very, um, you know, like a, a, a sound explanation of this, um, particularly from the Russian side. So I was very interested to know your thoughts on that and, and, and to find out, uh, you know, like what, what, what you think about these developments. Now, Oksana, coming back to your visit to Pakistan, um, you also interviewed the Prime Minister of Pakistan then, um, Mr. Imran Khan. When he was still the Prime Minister in the, in the final few days, I feel lucky. It was uh, coming to a fever pitch back then. You were here in some very interesting times. Uh, but uh, I, there, there was something that you said in that interview that I really wanted to call back to um, and, 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 and see how you feel about that. You said that... A, a bad peace is still better than a good war. And I would like for you to sort of unpack that for me in the current situation right now. I mean, was, uh, you know, were Russia and Ukraine in sort of a bad peace before this? Um, and how, how, how have things changed or evolved or devolved as you, as you see it right now? Yeah, I think uh, it was a rough translation from the uh, sort of idiom we have here in Russia. And we all subscribe to the idea, I think most of us, that war is the most horrible outcome possible. And I think that was uh, the thinking in the Kremlin for quite some time. Uh, I think Vladimir Putin is a, is a genuine believer, uh, a genuine Christian, and he believes that blessed are the peacemakers. So if, if you can actually uh, limit the... Uh, the pain and the suffering, uh, especially to innocent civilians, you, you are absolutely obligated to do that morally. But uh, on the other hand, uh, again, this is my interpretation. It's not that he confided in me. Uh, but uh, as a head of state, he has certain imperatives. And one of those imperatives is uh, Russia's national security. And I think the decision to launch this operation was made. And he, he's been actually pretty transparent about that. when. Uh, the West has significantly intensified the militarization of Ukraine, sending weapons there. And then if you remember back in February of 2022, Mr. Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, went to the Munich Security Conference. This is sort of the chief gathering um, uh, of uh, Western security analysts and decision makers, a little bit similar to Islamabad Security Dialogue, although less representative in terms of diversity of views. And over there at that conference, he started talking about the Ukraine needing to acquire a nuclear capability, and nobody said a word. And uh, at that time, despite the fact that there is a supposed a non-proliferation, nuclear non-proliferation regime in the world, so uh, the countries have agreed that uh, no one else should acquire a nuclear bomb, and yet the feeling, I think, was that uh, if it's Ukraine and if it's against Russia, then uh, that could be allowed to pass. And at that time, I remember many Russian analysts comparing the case of Ukraine to that actually of Pakistan. When uh, Pakistan acquired uh, nuclear technology, it was actually when the United States needed its support to fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. They sort of turned uh, turned the, the the blind eye to your country's uh, uh, efforts to do that, and um, I think 
at that point, uh, the decision was made in the Kremlin that we cannot wait any longer, that even if we wait, uh, it's going to be uh, detrimental to the country's security concerns. And that's when the decision was uh, made. But I also want to point out that the way the Russians fight their wars, despite all you hear in Western media, is with great attention to uh, civilian uh, casualties. We do not call them collateral damage. We do not do carpet bombings of the kind that the Americans did in Iraq or in Afghanistan. So the reason, one of the reasons why the Russian offensive is moving along so slowly is because it's actually primarily focused on uh, military targets. There is some targeting of uh, the power plants, uh, which do have a civilian uh, capacity, but they also serve the uh, Ukrainian military. And in hitting some of those power plants, the Russians are trying to under undermine their military enemy. But uh, with that ha having been said, I think there is still some, uh, not very hopeful, but there are still uh, some prisoner exchanges. For example, a couple of days ago, 63 uh, Russian Russian soldiers were released by the Ukrainians in exchange for some uh, Ukrainian soldiers. There is a uh, respectful treatment of the corpses of the enemy. So the Russians are giving them back. And this is very uh, important to us to treat both the captives and the and the dead with respect. So that's the way that's the way it goes. Yeah. And I, th I, I think there's a universal understanding of these values and these practices in times of war. I mean, you can only um, contain so much uh, horrors when it comes to uh, an outbreak of, of, of conflict between um, two states. But it is it is definitely very essential for, you know, like for the peace building process afterwards to respect these basic norms um, of uh, warfare as they are happening, like the prisoner exchange that you spoke of and also, um, you know, like paying heed to the dignity of, uh, of the dead and all of that. Um, and on that point also, I'd like to, um, you know, like uh, bring up yet another uh, sort of uh, Western media position. Um, the issue of uh, mercenary groups like Wagner. Um, now, Russia as a state, of course, uh, abides by certain rules and principles. But when it comes to, uh, you know, independent uh, private military contractors, they are not as such uh, bound by these uh, laws of international uh, uh, of international law. How do you see um, the involvement of these groups um, in the ongoing hostilities right now? Um, the Russian state has obviously said that they have nothing to do with these uh, groups, nor are they sanctioned by the Russian government. Uh, but clearly, they are taking a position that is, uh, you know, bringing gains for the Russian side. Um, so is there, you know, like, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I want to just highlight that you call them mercenaries, whereas, and that's how they are called uh, in Western media. Although when Americans refer to their own uh, uh, non-uniform fighters, they call them private military contractors. And uh, most of the American wars these days are done through uh, private uh, military contracting firms. So this is pretty much uh, the, well, I guess the staple of uh, international uh, power play, because uh, even though you, you said that the Russian government denies any association uh, with uh, Wagner, I, I don't think that's, <laughs> if that's the case, I haven't heard such statement. That if that's the case, that would not be a complete truth, because I'm sure they are not receiving direct orders, but uh, they're definitely acting in line with uh, the Russian, the general Russian policy. And Wagner, right. for example, is present not only in Ukraine, but they are also providing substantial uh, military services, security services to a number of African countries. And uh, I think that's actually one of the reasons why Western media hate them so much and call them mercenaries, because you actually have a competing security provider and not just the United States that comes everywhere and uh, dictates its terms and does whatever it wants. But when, uh, you know, a certain power have has a counterbalance, its, uh, its ability to do whatever it wants is limited. And right. I think it's actually not a coincidence that the West started pushing on Ukraine when Russia became ever more confident in uh, uh, reaching out of its uh, traditional sphere of influence, Russia's participation in Syria, military participation, Russia's presence in Africa in, in terms of military contractors and also as a uh, weapons seller. 
And uh, this is something that, by the way, uh, the deepening security ties between Russia and Pakistan, the Americans don't, don't like that. Uh-huh. They, they consider the rest of the world as sort of their own oyster that uh, w- where only they can control anything or dictate or set policy on uh, security and military matters. And that's why Russia presents such an irritant to the world, because it's one thing when you are competing, let's say, in the food business or even in uh, sort of information technologies. But when it comes to security provision, the provision of security services, it could be a a make or break situation. Russia has actually saved the government of Syria, the statehood of Syria, not Assad and his people, but the statehood of Syria, the state structures, uh, something that uh, it didn't do, for example, for Libya. And uh, there are many people who regret that. If uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the Libyan situation, but I, I, I visited Libya a couple of, years before the uh, murder uh, and violent, very violent murder of Gaddafi. And it was a relatively prosperous state. I mean, it was one of the richest states in uh, Northern Africa, for sure. And it's now a slave market. And whatever you think about Gaddafi, destroying that uh, state structure definitely was a major crime. It was a crime of humongous proportions. And uh, President Obama received his Nobel Peace Prize preemptively for that. but it does not minimize the fact that the whole country, whatever you think about its state structure, was destroyed and people were plunged from a relatively uh, developed state of being into absolute dark ages. I I, I think pretty much, at least in this uh, part of the world, um, you know, the, the U.S.'s involvement in, in a number of uh, proxy situations is, is well documented in history as well as in... Um, uh, traditional media narratives as well. Um, so I think there's no uh, sort of disagreement on that. Can I, Hadra, can, can I can I at one point, because I, I started talking about uh, private contractor, contractors and got diverted away from your direct question because you asked me about Ukraine and the presence of uh, these uh, people in Ukraine. And uh, I remember just the other day I was reading the telegram of uh, the head of Wagner uh-huh. Uh, Mr. Prigozhin, and he was commenting there about how strong are the Ukrainian fighters and how much respect he has for some of the of the people who are fighting on the other side. Because one of the things that we can respect in uh, in the Ukrainians, and th- there is a saying here in Russia that one of the reasons this war is so difficult is because it has some of the Russians uh, fighting against the Russians, because not all of them are like they Ukrainian by their civic affiliation, but many of them are. Uh, like from our common uh, cultural heritage. And uh, in this society, in this part of the world, personal valor, sacrifice for your compatriots or your comrades, dignity, honesty, uh, all of those are great values. And uh, even the head of this uh, private military group, Wagner, has enough, uh, has seen enough to complement Ukrainians on that. And that's why, again, the Russians uh, do take uh, pains to return the bodies of those who are killed because you can treat even the the enemy with respect. And we wouldn't have been the enemies if it uh, if it wasn't for you know the for the ill wishers and for the uh, very deliberate uh, policy of of the United States. At least that's my my view. I really hope that there is some um, logical and humane conclusion to. Um, this whole situation right now. Um, and speaking of, of uh, a logical conclusion to it, do you see a reasonable agreement um, that can stop the hostilities between these two countries? And what is your assessment of this and the conditions that are necessary uh, to bring them to the table on points where they can agree um, and not further devolve the situation? What, what do you see? What are some of the overarching conditions that would be necessary uh, to bring sort of a, a a positive sort of a um, peaceful ceasefire or, or you know, like a conclusion to the hostilities? Well, Hadra, if it were a war between Russia and Ukraine, sure. Uh, I, well, if it were between Russia and Ukraine, I don't think the hostilities, kinetic hostilities would ever have uh, broken out. But it's a war, at least the way we see it, it's a war between Russia and well, I want to say the West, but I think it's primarily the United States, which is like this uh, impotent uh, old person who is losing his power and he's still 
trying to grip onto it. They tried to do it by various ways, but uh, one of the ways of con- countering Russia is uh, by using Ukraine for that for that purpose, because uh, Ukraine is led by uh, a group of people who, in my view at least, and in the view of many Russians, are not pursuing Ukraine's national interest. It's, and I'm not saying that Ukraine's national interest is to be aligned with Russia, not at all. But if you're a country situated between you know, various groups of countries between Russia and Western Europe, you can uh, have a um, smart foreign policy and you will make sure that you get a little bit from everybody, just like Pakistan, for example. Uh, y- you are as- associated uh, with China, you have ties with the United States, you're trying to develop ties with Russia, with Africa, with many other countries. But uh, the problem is that the current leadership in Ukraine believes that the future of his country is only uh, as a battering ram against Russia. The other Ukraine, in that view, cannot exist. The Ukraine that trades with Russia, trades with the European Union, trades with whomever it wants to trade and has whatever uh, government it wants to have, democratic or not, the Ukraine that respects the rights of all its citizens to speak their mother tongues and read the books they want to read. Such Ukraine uh, doesn't exist in their imagination. For now, politically, Ukraine is a project that is explicitly geared militarily and politically, geopolitically against Russia. And as such, I don't see much uh, room for compromise because Russia cannot agree with being you know, with living side by side with a country that explicitly wants to be used to attack Moscow or, you know, Russia's development, Russia's place in this part of the world and in the world as such. So the only uh, answer to your question, which is, by the way, a good question and the one that I ask in pretty much every my program to all my uh, guests from around the world, and they say that peace can only exist when all sides make a conscious decision that stopping hostilities is more beneficial to them than uh, continuing to fight. And for the time being, for the West or for the United States, it makes no sense to stop fighting because it's a very cheap war for them. Sure, they're sending some weapons uh, to Ukraine, but they're not sending their own soldiers and they are accomplishing a very significant geopolitical goal. I mean, they they fought with us uh, during the Cold War. It, It was much much more expensive conflict, even though it was cold, but it it required them to spend much more money on that. Nowadays, they can continue doing that uh, by only wasting Ukrainian lives and uh, Ukrainian territory, Ukrainian future. Well, uh, it's it's an acceptable proposition to them, and apparently it's an acceptable proposition to the Ukrainian leadership. Once that, that, that logic changes, I'm sure there will be no problem uh, getting to the negotiating table. In fact, uh, if you remember, I think it was last April, there was a meeting in uh, in Turkey uh, brought together by the administration of uh, Tayyip Recep Erdogan. And that the meeting of foreign ministers was fairly successful. They reached a tentative agreement, but the next day uh, the Ukrainian leadership got in touch with the American uh, uh, sponsors and wisdom dispensers and their position changed and they said that they are going to fight until the very end. What the very end means in this case is an open question, but I don't think it means the end of Russia. Could it mean the end of Ukraine as uh, the NATO allies and um, the US as well? Um, they continuously funnel uh, weapon systems uh, to, you know, like to keep uh, the hostilities alive. Um, how do you see Ukraine emerging out of this situation? Because it's a very bleak picture that you paint. Very bleak picture and it reminds me of what uh, I mentioned with regards to Libya you know you can be a relatively well-doing country and everything can deteriorate in uh, in just a few years and I myself I'm I was born in Leningrad uh, the city that survived the 900 days of the German siege and one of the memories something that we are taught in school is that you know, when hunger came to the city, there was very limited supply of, uh, of food there. Uh, people diverted to cannibalism very, very fast. I mean, all the culture went astray because uh, to go from relative civilization, I mean, humanity to dark ages is, is actually, it doesn't take that much time. 
And I don't know, to be honest, in, in response to you, I don't know. I love Ukraine as it is. I have uh, relatives there. I really want uh, that culture, that that people to be who they are, because I think we all bring something very valuable to humanity. You know, that's the beauty of uh, ethnic and cultural and political diversity. And uh, if they wanted to pursue their own interest, I think Russia would uh, would not only help, would be the most eager supporter. In fact, there are many political analysts here in the country who say that Russia's, Russia would have been the best uh, sort of guardian of Ukraine's neutrality, because this way it would have had a vested interest in keeping Ukraine neutral between the East and West. But then the West moved to sort of gobble Ukraine whole and turn it into a sort of a flat storm against uh, Russia. And that, um, you know, as long as this uh, logic of uh, Ukraine as an anti-Russia persists, uh, I, I see no prospects, but once Ukrainian, Ukrainians become Ukrainians, that is true to themselves, you know, pursuing their own selfish interests rather than doing the American bidding, then I think everything should be more hopeful. I, I really do hope that the, you know, there is a solution that comes before the loss of uh, unimaginable lives. Um, Oksana, thank you so much for sharing your uh, thoughts with us on uh, these very pertinent issues. And it's not very often that we see um, or hear voices uh, that, that present a counter narrative to the kind of uh, coverage of this uh, situation that we've been seeing in the media. So I really, really appreciate you taking out the time for this talk and also for all the work that you do um, at RT and um, you know, re representing sort of a, uh, a counter voice um, in uh, Western media as well. And linked to that, I will present to you my last question, um, uh, which is, uh, I just want to know, so you started in, in, in journalism as a, as a, a political correspondent, and, and you've made your way uh, to being one of the most uh, known and one of the most respected voices um, in global journalism. Um, how was that for you, considering the fact that you were not on a on a on an even playing field, let's say, um, you know, like uh, making yourself a voice in the English language uh, uh, journalism spheres, and then also being a woman in what is mostly a male-dominated field. Uh, how did these two uh, aspects of your identity intersect uh, throughout your career? Well, uh, thank you very much for your very generous de description. I'm not sure I, I'm up to, up to it just yet, but uh, it's a good question. And um, good question in the sense that I would also, it will give me an opportunity to sort of uh, uh, give this compliment back to you. Uh, I started not as a political correspondent, but as a like litty, a little city reporter at the age of 16. And uh, I learned English uh, all by myself. I'm from a very poor family, and none of my students went, none of my parents went to university, let alone uh, studied foreign languages. But uh, in Russia, there are enough public libraries when you can master that. And this is how I I wanted to know the world. And I started studying English in the evenings and working. Uh, in the newspaper during the day and slowly but surely uh, my world expanded to become uh, a, a correspondent who's traveled uh, the world, who's covered many wars, who's covered UN General Assemblies, who's covered many different issues. And I think uh, one of the reasons uh, that I was able to do that, and I think that's one of the reasons also why, you know, journalists from Pakistan and from Africa, from many other sort of unconventional non-Western part of the world have a great prospect is because when you come with something new and genuine, people are genuinely interested. Your accent may be off a little bit and the Americans usually have difficulties uh, understanding what I'm saying, but I always tell them, uh, quoting one of the movies, that the fact that I'm speaking with an accent doesn't mean that I'm thinking with an accent. Although for them, perhaps, you know, having a Russian worldview or an African or Pakistani worldview may be kind of, it may equate to thinking with an accent. Nevertheless, the world is diverse. People have hunger for, not necessarily truth. They want to reserve truth for themselves, but they need various inputs to be able to exercise their critical thinking, to give their consciousness the ability to 
arrive at their own point of view and you can do that and this is what I would encourage uh, journalists like yourself and many others to do because in this day and age of great power politics or and sort of the Western uh, narrative uh, sort of fighting with the Russian narrative, what have you, even though, you know, our capabilities in the informational sphere, are, uh, they, they cannot be compared. But what I find very encouraging is that uh, when I speak to people like you, I can engage with the world that is at a distance from this conflict and they don't have a vested interest. They don't have to support either of the side and they can actually offer some interesting analysis or some fresh ideas for the sake of humanity as a whole because at the end of the day we what we all want is dignity uh fairness uh respect for each other we want to enjoy each other's culture and presence but we also want to be ourselves and uh, i think it's uh, new outlets from uh non-Western parts of the world or those who are, you know, daring enough to offer their own thinking that hold the future and that hold uh, whatever prospect for peace there is. Yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's basically what we're trying to do here at Infer, uh, to invite perspectives that may or may not align with perspectives that we hold. Uh, but there is a spirit of curiosity about finding out about the world and how ourselves but also others how 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 everyone interacts with the the truth of the world and what they make of it um so thank you so much uh for uh giving us that insight and thank you so much for uh being so candid with us about a range of issues um honestly i was a little uh nervous about this but uh, it's 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 been one of uh, one of one of the best conversations perhaps that i've had um inside out or outside in for so uh yeah thank you so much oksana thank you thank you the, the pleasure was all mine thank you guys thank you so much for staying with us through this conversation about issues that are very pertinent in today's day and age um, our team works very very hard to bring these conversations to you and to maintain the highest level of uh, credibility and integrity for this information so we would really appreciate if you could give us a like share our content if you enjoyed it uh, and if you know someone who'd be interested in hearing this, please send it their way. And if you want to stay informed about uh, the rest of our work, please hit the bell icon and subscribe to our channel.